Hi everyone, my name is Jen. If you're new to my channel, I am an author and I talk about books on this channel. I review books, I talk about the history of fairy tales, and I also talk about the representation of disfigurement and disability. I have been making videos on this channel for about six years now, and one of the first videos that I made when I started this channel was called something along the lines of why I read and write. Um, having EEC syndrome, exodermal dysplasia. And it was a video that I knew that I would have to make or that I wanted to make when I started my channel because I have exodermal dysplasia or more specifically, a form of exodermal dysplasia called EEC syndrome. And I knew I was gonna have to talk about that because people would ask me about my appearance and it was easier to have a video that I could link to send people to saying, all of the answers are in that video, you can just go there. Um, but that video is now six years old and more than six years old. And also in that video, even though it's true, everything that I said, the video, I made it in a very, let's speed through everything very quickly, tell you how fine I am and how we can move past these things and, and focus on the stuff that I, that I would like to talk about, which is normally books, which is fair enough. Like that, that's how I used to talk about EEC syndrome. It's a complicated, really complicated rare condition that people haven't heard of. Whenever I go and see a doctor, there's normally a Wikipedia page open, apart from a couple of my specialists who do know a lot about it. Uh, people haven't come across it before and it affects so many different parts of the body that it's kind of a complicated thing to talk about. I end up gabbling and then just being like, right, okay, anyway, so how are you? <laughs> um, and as I said, that's all well and good and that's definitely what I used to need to do. Um, because I was, I guess, battling with internal ableism, which every disabled person does uh, continuously. Um, so whilst that video is six years old, it is linked in every single one of my videos. And it's still the video that if someone says, what's wrong with your hands? I go, well, and then I link that video. So I kind of wanted to redo that video and talk to you a little bit about what EEC syndrome is but not relate that to, and this is why I write books, and this is why I do these things, just the condition itself, um, for a few reasons, for myself, also because I know that over the past six years, lots of people, I say lots, a few, again, we're a rare species, several people with EEC syndrome have found my videos and I know from personal experience that it is a comfort to see somebody else with your condition existing and talking about it and I'll link the person that I first saw talking about it later in this video. Um, so for those people too and also for parents, so many parents more than people my age or older with EEC who have found these videos. Lots of parents, dozens of parents have found these videos who have just had a child with EEC, with it being a new um, genetic blip in their family. They're not familiar with it. They're trying to find out as much information. And again, seeing someone who has EEC, and in my case is in my 30s, existing, talking about it, I know is a helpful thing. So I'm updating that video. That's what this video is. And I'm not gonna go on at length about EEC at all, but I'm gonna try and talk about it in a more measured way than I did the other time that I talked about it. I also have a series of videos on this channel where I talk about disability and disfigurement as represented in the media. And I have a few videos where I talk about specific parts of EEC syndrome and how my feelings on those have evolved. So I'll link all of that in the description box down below too. That was a long introduction, wasn't it? Okay, so EEC syndrome is extradactyly ectodermal dysplasia clefting syndrome. It is a form of ectodermal dysplasia and we're not sure how many types of ectodermal dysplasias there are. We used to think, I say we, scientists <laughs> used to think that there were over 150, but the more research that's been done, some conditions have been pulled together, they found out they're actually the same thing. I think it's about 120-ish um, different kinds of ectodermal dysplasia that are agreed upon right now. My form of ectodermal dysplasia is EEC syndrome, as I said, that is ectodermal dysplasia clefting syndrome. 
Ectrodactyly is to do with my hands and ectodermal dysplasia. Ectodermal is the skin and dysplasia is the incorrect reproduction of skin cells. My particular form of EUC is caused by a mutation on the P63 gene. It is a protein change and I am the only person in my family who has EEC syndrome but now that I have it, it is a, a dominant gene that can be passed on um, in future generations. So my parents didn't know that I was going to be born with this syndrome. It didn't get picked up on scans. And I was born in January 1987, which is exactly nine months, pretty much to the day since Chernobyl happened, the Chernobyl disaster. You can never prove or know why a specific genetic mutation happens within the womb if it is not hereditary but there was a significant increase in the number of children born with limb differences in the northeast of England in the two years following the Chernobyl disaster and elsewhere due to acid rain and radiation and that's what my parents were told when when I was born that it was because of Chernobyl that's been t said to me by geneticists later as well uh, it's a weird thing to think about like it, it doesn't matter having an answer to that sort of thing but it is a strange Thing to think about that that might be why like this big thing that happened so far away is why i was born the way that i am it's interesting if nothing else so i was born with syndactyly and ectrodactyly syndactyly is where all of or most of in my case all of your bones and skin are fused together in your hands. So I was essentially born, I guess, really without hands. They were just lumps of bone and skin and ectrodactyly, which is missing fingers. It can also affect your feet as well. I have syndactyly on my feet, but not ectrodactyly. It varies from person to person. So I had to have lots of operations to reconstruct my hands when I was young. My first operation, was when I was three months old. And um, I tried to do a, a timeline with my mum. I mean, we were trying to work out how many operations I had had and at, at which point in time. I was just trying to gather my thoughts on the subject, but she couldn't remember how many operations I had, just that it, it was a lot. Um, and so much so that the doctor said they would have to stop at one point because they were worried that I was having too much general anaesthetic. Um, so they reconstructed my hands and to do that, as I said, they had to have um, lots of operations. They had to use skin grafts because of course, if you're working with a lump like this and then you're stretching out fingers and bones and pinning them, there's not enough skin here to make sure everything is covered. So I had skin grafts taken from the tops of my legs and then they were patchwork onto patchwork, patchworked onto my hands um, in order to create the, the hands that I have now. Um, so you can see scars running up all up and down the sides um, of each finger and then different colours of skin on my hands where you know, it's been taken from different parts of my body. I used to do, which I think I mentioned in the, the other video, the one that I did six years ago, that I would make hand puppets to try and amuse my doctors and nurses. Um, so this one would always be a little tortoise and I would draw a face on it. And then this one here would be Nelly the elephant, which you could even draw an eye on because the um, scar tissue here from the skin graft even looks like an elephant ear and that used to amuse me endlessly. So I was constantly in hospital, not just for operations, but also for physio. I would wear splints at night to help my fingers or encourage my fingers to grow in a certain way. And um, yeah, that's the thing that most people notice if, um, it's something to do with, with my condition. And a quick caveat here, a polite request please, uh, to not have comments down below, either saying that you hadn't noticed or you like to ig ignore my hands and just listen to the things that I am saying. That's not the compliment that you, that you think it is. Um, so the hands are the most obvious things about me to do with my condition and the things that are probably at the moment deteriorating the most because whilst surgeons did do an amazing job crafting hands for me, uh, I have arthritis, um, I have tennis innovitis, 
they are disintegrating a little bit and in some videos you you may see me wearing um compression wraps to um help with hypermobility dislocated joints arthritis and all of that stuff but my hands whilst they were the things that were operated on the most when i was young weren't the things that concerned my doctors the most i think at least this is going by what my mum said the thing that she was most worried about was my eyes um, ectodermal dysplasia, as I said, is the incorrect reproduction of skin cells, but it's a clefting syndrome too, which means that you have more or less of certain things. So I had fewer fingers the, than I was supposed to, um, and I was also born effectively without tear ducts. And in my face and in the faces of lots of people who have EEC syndrome, the pathways between our eyes, our nose and our ears, and then going into our lungs are all cleft as well. So it's like a, a maze, I suppose. There are lots of um, pathways that come off the main ones and then have dead ends, which means if we get infections, then we get sick pretty badly because our body finds it hard to get rid of stuff. We also can't produce mucus in the same way, very sexy. Uh, and my eyes were extremely dry because I was born without tear ducts. So when I was two, we had to come down to London and have several operations to implant tear ducts. And I have cl cr chronic, chronic blepharitis, which is a, a lifelong condition to do with the eyes because of that. So they were the things that I was hospitalized for in emergencies as a child, whereas all of my appointments for my hands were, were scheduled things. So I think because it can be unpredictable the way that it affects your eyes, that seemed scarier at the time. And it's also the thing that's scarier going forward, which, which I will get to in a minute. As well as affecting my hands and my feet and my eyes, EEC syndrome can also mean that you're born with a cleft palate. I didn't have a cleft palate myself, but I did have to have operations on my jaw um, for reasons to do with ectodermal dysplasia. It also affects your skin and means that you have fewer sweat glands. That means that we can't regulate our temperature and it's dangerous for us to get hot. We can't cool ourselves down, so then we'll pass out. And also it's dangerous to ha for us to have um, um, a sustained temperature if we're sick as well because our body shuts down too. EEC, it being a clefting syndrome and having more or less of certain things, I don't have all the teeth again that I should have and I've had to have many different kinds of operations to try and make the teeth as best as they can with the ones that I have. EEC affects the epithelial cells. So those are the cells that cover your body, so your skin. They are your skin, but they are also the cells that cover your organs internally. And they have a whole plethora of reasons to exist, but one of those is for protection and to protect you against viruses. And with the degeneration of the epithelial cells, that can cause a number of problems. So I have a double ureter, which in itself is not an uncommon condition. People can have that. I think it's one in a thousand people have that, which is a, a double pipeline between your kidney and your bladder. Basically, it makes you over-efficient, which is, you know, good. But having the epithelial cell damage means that I have, and many other people with EEC have, interstitial cystitis, which is where your body, because you have lots of infections as a child, attacks the lining of your bladder and damages it irreparably, which causes lots of problems. Um, it also means that when you get older, though it can also happen when you're younger with EEC, it happened to me in my early 30s, that your body attacks the epithelial cells on your head, so your scalp, uh, and that's part of an autoimmune disease, which is scarring alopecia. Again, lots of people have alopecia as a thing on its own. It's just this is lots of different things connected by one syndrome because it, it's ingrained in all reproduction of skin cells because it happens so early on in um, in the development of me as a person in the womb. Um, so I started to lose my hair in my early 30s. I have lost, I would say, at least half of my hair now and that's why I always, pretty much always wear hats in videos and if I'm not wearing a hat then I'm wearing these fabulous headscarves which um, have become a fun thing, actually, a fun fashion accessory to play around with. Scarring alopecia is unlike most other alopecias. It is a rare form of it. I think only 3% of all alopecias are scarring alopecias. And it's not just the loss of hair, but it's the body 
replacing the type of cells that you find on your head so they're replacing the skin cells with scar tissue which means that your hair cannot grow back um, so there's no cure for it I do not need any medical advice on, on this at all there is nothing that we can do about that and I've made peace with that it's okay. I don't know how much of my hair I'll continue to lose. Um, it may be that I lose all of it. It may be that it burns out at a certain point and I stop losing more of it. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. You never know what's going to happen. That's why it's so <laughs> hashtag exciting. <laughs> my body attacking its epithelial cells is not just um, a cause of interstitial cystitis or um, hair loss it's also linked with my body attacking the corneal stem cells so this is the thing that terrifies me the most getting older when i was younger to step back a bit when i was younger i think because of the way healthcare system works and because this is maybe the only way you feel you can approach it as doctors as a child in the healthcare system with a disability who was going through all of these different procedures all of these operations all of this physio in and out of hospital all of the time it felt like there was going to be an end goal that i would reach a certain point as a teenager where they would have reconstructed all of my hands and they would have done any up to date operations that they would need to do to adjust webbing as i got older and my hands grew there would be a point where they would have finished dental work and operations on my jaw um, where I wouldn't have problems with my kidneys anymore. Um, that there would be this point where I would be set free into the wild world and told, okay, well now you're done. We have crafted you, off you go. Um, I don't know if that was something that I assumed as a child or if it's something that was really pressed into me, if it's something that doctors really believed, um, if it was because they were getting me to a certain point because you have a doc the same doctor as a child and then you're transferred to adult doctors so maybe it was they were trying to reach that goal where they would hand me over at a certain age as opposed to then I would be fine but I, I kind of thought I'd understood my body and that we'd reached a point when I was 18 where I'd had as many hand surgeries as I was going to need for a while um, and as I said I'd finished dental surgery where I, I thought I'd I guess made peace with my body where I was like, right, I understand how you're working now. I get it. But I didn't understand because I, as I said, was born in the 80s. I wasn't told what my condition was. Doctors didn't pull everything together. I was seeing so many different specialists for so many different things. No one had thought, wait, are these things connected? until my dentist mentioned something one day and then I ended up googling all of the things that I have and I found a wikipedia page like my doctors do these days for EEC syndrome and it was baffling just to think that there was an answer for why there were all of these strange seemingly disparate things wrong with me um, and so I printed out the page and I took it to my hand surgeon and he said I hope you don't have this because it's not very nice, you know? And I always thought that was such a strange thing for him to say to me because I thought, well, I know because I live in this body and if that's the thing that I have, then I understand it because I'm here and, and I live it. So you think it's terrible because you're on the outside looking in, but I already know because you're talking about me. It seemed like such a strange thing for him to say. Now I understand more what he meant because it's a degenerative condition and I didn't know that at the time. So there was me thinking, I understand my body. We've reached the end goal of all the operations and procedures that I need to go through. I am an adult now and I am ready to go out into the world uh, with my visual differences and, and that's it. And that wasn't it. So I was sent to a geneticist who is amazing and he is someone who specializes in external dysplasia. Um, I don't think I talked about incidence rates actually for ectodermal dysplasia again because it's so rare people aren't sure but I think ectodermal dysplasia having one of those 120 types of ectodermal dysplasia is about one in 10,000 people and EEC syndrome is thought to be about one in 100,000 people so it is a very very rare condition 
and he did genetic testing to check my DNA to see if I did have EEC syndrome and said, okay, right, yes, you do have EEC syndrome. And I thought, well, that's great. It's lovely to have an answer to that. And he said, well, no, sit down. So now we have to talk about what this means. Um, and he told me about hair loss, which I wasn't experiencing yet at that point in my life. I was in my early 20s. So he said, this might happen. And also, there is a strong possibility that you will lose your sight. And I was so angry. I was so angry because I thought I'd unlocked all the levels. And I thought, you know, I had it down. And then, of course, no, no, absolutely not. As I said, EEC syndrome presents differently in everyone who has it. Um, not every single symptom is different, but the severity um, changes between people and, and also changes when you might get certain things. So it affects the ear canal. So I have very narrow ear canals, which can mean that you're born deaf if you have EEC syndrome. Um, and it affects your eyes. As I said, I had to have operations on my eyes and I have chronic blepharitis, but those are manageable conditions um, that I treat every day and it's just part of my routine but you can be born um, blind or partially blind with EEC syndrome, or it can get you later in life. Um, so it attacks epithelial cells. You have those on your eye. Your cornea is your skin cell across your eye. And like with the alopecia, so that's an autoimmune disease. My body thinks there's a problem with your with your scalp, there isn't. It's just anxious. <laughs> We've all been there. It's anxious and it thinks there's a problem. We must attack that problem. Uh, we must replace it with scar tissue. It does a similar thing with the corneal stem cells. It thinks that there is a problem and it starts reproducing those cells incorrectly. This <laughs> means that you lose your sight and that is amplified by the fact that we have dry eyes which also gets worse as we get older. Um, I didn't used to have to use eye drops, now I use them between 10 and 20 times a day and then I have to use a special oil on my eyes when I sleep. When I wake up in the morning I physically cannot open my eyes because they're so dry so I have to have the eye drops where they are and if they're not there I get very freaked out because then I can't find them, I can't open my eyes, if I open them without using drops I damage my corneas and then my body struggles to repair it. My body is not at the stage where it has forgotten how to reproduce cornea cells or reproduces them incorrectly, reproduces them as scar tissue, um, but the other things that are happening with my eyes indicate that it will start doing that. My eyelashes now grow into my eyeball. I am really sorry for that image. I know that it's really not a nice image. And at the moment I can, again, I'm sorry, <laughs> pluck them out myself with tweezers. Because EEC is about the incorrect reproduction of cells that reproduce quickly, you've got to be careful because if cells are reproducing quickly and incorrectly, that of course can mean other not nice things that you wouldn't want inside your body. Um, thankfully, any growth that I have had uh, so far have been non-cancerous, so I have a non-cancerous growth in my tumour. I have some neuromas in my fingers, which are non-cancerous tumours that grow on nerves. Um, those tend to grow because of surgery, though. So, for instance, if a nerve gets snipped accidentally during surgery, it might blossom into a lovely little non-cancerous tumour. I have one that lives on this finger, which I call Brian. He's annoying, he's very, very painful. He has to get trimmed back every so often, like a tree. <laughs> uh, and it also causes things like hyperperichoritosis, which is the quick reproduction of skin cells after trauma, specifically in the mouth, um, which I've had to have biopsied several times. That was a fun time, the first time that I had that done as a teenager, because I didn't really know what that meant. I thought when they said they were gonna biopsy it, they were just gonna take a swab, but then they cut out. A centimeter of my tongue and that was not the one. In summary, in summary, EEC syndrome affects the skin, the hair, the eyes, the ears, the mouth. Sounds like the beginning of a song. Heads, shoulders, knees and toes. <laughs> um, where was I? Sorry, I'm try I shouldn't try and be funny about this. Okay, right, it affects the hair, the skin, the eyes, 
the ears, the mouth, the teeth, the kidneys. Um, it also affects my hands, that's it. Uh, and sweat glands and whatever else I mentioned in this video is quite a few different things. Uh, and going forward, um, I'm gonna have to have more surgery on my hands to keep them as functioning as as they can be. A lot of ligaments are coming away from the bone, so much dislocation, so much arthritis. They have done very, very well and, and hopefully they will continue to assist me as much as they can. And I am monitored for my eyesight as well, which is the thing that, to be honest, scares me the most. Um, I'm not really sure how to describe it, but it's like living in an in-between space, which I think we all understand. I'm filming this at the beginning of 2021, if you're watching this in the future. Um, living in the in-between space, grieving something that hasn't happened yet, but is very, very likely to happen, and trying to work out how you plan for that, because you can't really, you just have to continue doing the things that, that you love and walking, to, uh, work, walking, working towards the things that, that you want to achieve. There is nothing that I can do apart from the eye care that I already do to, to stop this. There is no cure for this. Maybe in the future there will be with stem cell treatment like corneal uh, transplants don't work because it's embedded in the DNA, then your body just reproduces it incorrectly again. Like, there is no current treatment that works for that but there may be at some point in the future. Uh, so learning to kind of sit with that and live with that and discuss it um, with, you know, the people that I love and I'm close to when I feel I need to, um, I guess giving space to it without it becoming completely overwhelming because I think you could, you could definitely and understandably allow something like that to completely overwhelm you and it's difficult to, to find that balance um at living in the reality of something before the true impact of that has, has physically hit one of the reasons i wanted to make this video this month is because it's ectodermal dysplasia awareness month i will link the nved in the description box down below that's the national federation for ectodermal dysplasia they're based in the states i am obviously based in the uk but there isn't uh, an equivalent over here so if you wanted to learn more about ectodermal dysplasia they have lots of resources on their website and if you did want to donate any money um, towards research for all kinds of ectodermal dysplasia, including EEC syndrome and research into saving our eyeballs, then you can always donate to them. Again, their website is linked down below. At the beginning of this video, I talked about uh, the importance of, of seeing yourself um, represented and how I know people with EEC or other forms of external dysplasia have found this channel comforting and I mentioned that I would link the first person that I had seen with EEC online and that is a woman called Nora. I came across her video, I think it was, it must have been just after it was uploaded, so maybe seven years ago, uh, and it's a film that her brother made called Me and EEC and Nora is talking about growing up in Nova Scotia in Canada uh, in the 70s with EEC syndrome and her experience of that. A funny thing to do with EEC is that we all kind of look like each other. Um, I set up a Facebook group for EEC syndrome years ago when I first found out that I had it so that we could try and find each other and share medical knowledge and that has been so useful and again to use that word comforting um, but because we're Facebook friends Often Facebook will suggest that I tag myself as somebody else or that they tag themselves as me because they mistake us and that's just really amusing. So Nora was the first person that I saw um, online with EEC. She is older than me and she has already lost her sight and when we were kids, we looked exactly the same. I'm gonna take some stills from her video and put them alongside pictures of me. It was really bizarre because I didn't know that we all looked like each other when I found that particular video. And since then, even last week, I got a message from a woman in Germany who said, hi, I'm your twin, and then sent me a picture of herself and she has EEC and I showed it to my husband and he said, 
wait, when did you used to wear your hair like that? I don't remember you having hair like that. And I was like, that's not me. It's bizarre, very, very bizarre. So I will link Nora's video in the description box down below as well. I have spoken about my feelings surrounding some of these things in videos that I've made about disfigurement and disability, not just with regard to my condition, but with regard to books and media. And I'll link that playlist in the description box down below. Um, some of these things I don't think I've spoken about before. And, and there are lots of other things that I could say <laughs> about this. I have talked longer about it than I did the first time round, but of course it's a lot of stuff to get into and we don't have the space here to do that. But I hope that this video has been helpful to those who were interested or perhaps have a similar thing and wanted to understand more about it. Um, it may give you more context. Well, it definitely will give you more context to me as a person. It's such a huge part of, of who I am. And I know that it's, maybe this is why I find it strange to talk about, less strange than I used to, but because it's such a fundamental part of who I am, uh, because it affects my day-to-day -day life in ways that you wouldn't know I was going to say if you watch these videos, but many people in my life don't know because I, I don't talk about it all the time because it's a degenerative thing um, and it's not something that I want to talk about all the time. Uh, it, it's nice to have a dedicated space like this video to kind of give a brief outline of, of everything for context. It helps me as well as, as other people. I'm sure I'll remember something afterwards that I haven't said. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments section down below. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again very soon. Also, if you're new, please do subscribe. I talk about books. Lots of love. Bye.